God is a frequency. It's our job to tune in. God is not a man. You hear people say reference God is him, he. They have this illusion that there's this sky daddy with a magic wand floating around granting wishes. That just really, in my research, isn't the case. It's more of a frequency, a divine frequency that is imbued in every living thing in the entire universe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where did religion come along? Oh, that's a great question. So in ancient times, people were more into spirituality. When we got to one of the highest advanced civilizations, which started out in Sumer and then migrated over into the land of Kemet before it became Egypt. Was that Sumeria then? Is Sumer Sumeria? Yes, it is. Sumeria. Yes. And when would that have been? Well, the tablets date back about six, eight thousand years. But yeah. those tablets we discovered were recopied from even older tablets, which going back probably about 100 to 200 thousand years prior. We're talking about a deep, deep, deep antiquity of super ancient culture. Even in the Emerald Tablets, when they relocated home base to the land of Kemet, in the Emerald Tablets, they're 36,000 year old texts. They rebuild the land of Kem uh, out of the mud, which because it, there was a great flood. So we're talking about ancient knowledge. They said they rebuilt Kem. They didn't build it for the first time. They said they were going to bring it back up to a high level of civilization. So it was already high before the flood. And we're talking about tens of thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so they began to uh, create these mystery schools uh, at this at dawn of this new era, 36,000 years ago. The gentleman who started this, his name was Thoth, T-H-O-T-H. And he's known as a wisdom keeper. He's known all over the entire world. And every continent I've been to, there's a depiction of him there. Even in the outback of Australia, they've wow. got him etched into a petroglyph in the, in the rock. Okay? And so this is With wild. Nose, so this right? guy's the beak, the long beak nose. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. That that's him. He's he doesn't really have a bird head, but he he's depicted as such because right. The, the ibis bird depicts bringing darkness to light because the beak is so long, it goes deeper down into the mud to bring sustenance up. Symbolic. So that's the, symbolic, right? Symbology. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. But he ruled over the land of Kemet for 14 or 16,000 years, roughly thereabout, according to the ancient Egyptians. And then he left there and went to Mesoamerica and kickstarted the Teotihuacan civilization it, in Mexico City. You have Teotihuacan. You have all down throughout yeah. um, Tulum and all the way down to Chichen Itza. That was all his master architectural plan. And Teotihuacan is part of his African name, which is also known as Tehuti. And Teotihuacan in Mexico really means uh, the city of Tehuti that he built out there. So he left there. And that's why the pyramid complex there mirrors the one mm. at Giza in Africa. Mm. And Kem, when you refer to Kem is where he went next. Mm -hmm. That's Egypt. That's Egypt. Yeah. So Kem... After uh, Kim fell, after a golden age, they fell. And when it uh, came back, you know, they the Dogons were overthrown there and they were moved out to Mali, Africa. And a new group came in. Uh, and that was probably closer to one of the uh, first dynastic periods that started. And that was still a long, long time ago. But over mm -hmm. time, the name Egypt, which came out of Greece, took hold. And that's the name we call it today. But the original name of the land is Kemet. And so these these mystery schools started. And so these mystery schools were to teach the spirituality to adept initiates and to pass it down uh, through verbal teachings. And then when some of these super masters began to pass away or leave or disappear, whatever you want to call it, some of these pyramid priests and temple priests realized the power that this knowledge had and began to alter and remix it. Mm -hmm. They understood the psychology and the neuroscience behind this and how it could control masses of people. So they started to twist the the, the scripture and twist the words mm. um, and kind of utilize it for darkness instead of light. And then we're able to then put people into a box and put real controls on them and dominate them and secure them, bringing them food, bringing them sacrifices, bringing them money. The sacrifices were not for God. The sacrifices were so they can eat. Oh, <laughs> so uh, they weren't yeah. going to go hunting. Yeah. <laughs> you know right? what I mean? A lamb. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. If you go to Egypt, you go to all these temples, you'll find the storehouses where all the sacrifices will be put and salted and stored and, and hung and dried so that these people can have food to eat because they weren't going to go hunting for anything. They weren't going to grow any crops. So it was all a big scam. So religion started with Toth or was that just because he started putting things down on a tablet? Is there so this was this was sort of the start of it? Yeah. So they they took his teachings, his spiritual teachings. He's all mm -hmm. about seeking the light evading the darkness, 
understanding how to raise and be born again through conscious thought. The first baptism that was taught is in the animal tablets. He talks about being baptized via elevated consciousness, being able to rise up to another level and look back to see where you were before. And you'll be born again many times in one lifetime if you continue to ascend. It had nothing to do with splashing water and dumping your head in the pool and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, that was also another twist of the of the information. If you look at the Emerald Tablets, so I wrote this book called Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, which has been a bestseller worldwide for four years. Hmm. It's now, I think, currently number one, actually, number one out of three million books in ancient civilizations. Uh, in that book, I put the New Testament where Jesus is speaking, and I mm -hmm. put both the Atlanteans' words from the Emerald Tablets side mm -hmm. by side. <laughs> and you see that Jesus is literally mimicking what he learned from the ancient mystery schools which he learned directly from the Egyptian mysteries from Thoth the Atlanteans' teachings. So he's not saying anything new in the New Testament. All those words that were spoken by him were information that he was taught because the real text is 36,000 years old. Uh, and of course, we know the Bible was written between 100 AD to 900 AD, long after the people were long gone. Uh, mm. So it's just a mimicking of ancient texts. And people began to take spiritual concepts and a lot of different religions cropped out of his spiritual writings that he wrote in those animal tablets. So have you seen the uh, the documentary movie called Zeitgeist? Yes. Were they basic? It was fascinating. The beginning mm -hmm. is all about basically Jesus and the 12 apostles and dying and reborn three days later and the timing and everything. And and they overlay it into uh, more and more and more ancient times and how it's the yeah. same story over and over again. So yeah. is that the is that an archetypical archetypal thing or is that um, the same consciousness coming back over and over again and doing the same thing? Is that someone learning from the past? Why would that happen? Yeah. So the story kept getting rewritten. The story did happen originally thousands of years before Jesus was even born. And then the story kept getting copied over and over and over. The true story of Jesus has really never truthfully fully been read. The, 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 the Sinai Bible is probably closest to the truth because the Sinai Bible was written before the King James Bible and some of the other canonized books. And there's about 14,000 differences between the two. And one of the biggest discrepancies is Jesus was never crucified. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. Harvard has a copy of the book of Jesus's wife in its seminary library. What? So most likely he got married, had kids, and the Merovingian bloodline most likely is still walking the planet till this very, very day. And so I think that those stories of the ancient, situ uh, you know, the ancient cultures having that same story over and over again was just it being copied again from culture to culture and being reread and the names being slightly changed, but it happened originally uh, thousands of years prior with oh. Horace. So yeah. did the actual actions happen again, or it's just the story being rewritten over and over again? Just the story being rewritten over and over again with different names uh, to the same exact tale. Yeah, just so, like if you read the Epic of Gilgamesh, you uh -huh. discover that's the true story of Noah's Ark in the Bible. They copied it from the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's not two separate stories. It's the same exact story being rewritten. So who was Jesus then? What is the story? I believe that Jesus, his real name is Yeshua. First of all, he was a real person that did exist. I've been to the house where he grew up uh, in Egypt, because if you remember in the Bible, Jesus disappears from the Bible at the age of 12. Mm -hmm. he disappears. You don't see him again until he's 32. He's gone. Where does he go? The gospel of the Holy 12, which was left out of the Bible, has the answer. He goes to Egypt. I've been there. If you go to Coptic Cairo, you can go to the house where Jesus and his mother lived in there in, in, in that area. And it's become, it's be, they, they turned it into like a crypt now. So you can go there, you can, you know, see where the, the bed he slept in and everything is still there. Hmm. And um, he was learning the Egyptian mysteries. From there, he went all the way up into Tibet to learn Reiki healing and Qigong. Hmm. And that's been confirmed by the Dalai Lama. And then he left from there and went down into India to learn the mystic arts, teaching reincarnation all the way back to Egypt. And then the Bible picks up, I call my son out of Egypt. And then you see him appear on the don back of a donkey in Jerusalem at the age of 32. And that's where the Bible text picks him back up as coming back in. But he was a very spiritual being. He was a virgin birth. And what's interesting is in the Apocrypha text, the text that was kept out of the Bible, you discover his grandmother, Mary's mother, was also a virgin birth. 
And if you look at the Sumerian tablets, you discover that these virgin births were not unusual. They were experimenting in these types of in vitro fertilization techniques where they would take an egg and put it in the womb and take it to term, not their egg, another uh, woman's egg. Um, and they have this whole section in Egypt called uh, the Hathor's Temple at Dendera, where they yeah. had these birthing centers where they were doing yeah. this. I've been there. Yeah. yeah. The front, the when you walk into Dendera, the first temple on the yes. right um, before exactly. the main temple. And then there's Isis's temple behind that. Yes, that's it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, they get that right. At least they said that that was the birthing <laughs> temple. They got that right. Yeah. I think he's half human, half Atlantean. That's my personal opinion. So if they were placing an egg inside of a woman, it wasn't mm -hmm. hers. Right. Correct. So he was a virgin birth. And so was his, his grandmother was also a virgin birth. They were planted on this timeline for a specific reason by the people who control from behind the scenes, which were these, they call themselves the ordainers of destiny in the Sumerian tablets. They control, they believed that they had the right to control destinies on this planet. And they would, they would use this crystal tablet to see potential outcomes and futures that they wanted. And they would then pick the one they wanted to coalesce into one real outcome. And they would go behind, go, go ahead, putting action behind that to make that reality come true for them. Masters at manifesting. So was this bloodlines then? Were they yes, were they bloodlines. playing with bloodlines and the yes. inherent skills that these bloodlines or these inherent genetic um, advantages that they had? Was that what they were yes. working with to create a superhuman? Yep. You're exactly right. They had prior to the flood. The Anunnaki, who are, who are also the Atlanteans, that's the same people. The Atlantean is a civilization. Anunnaki means those who came from heaven to earth. So it's like if we travel to Mars, we wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I'm Billy Carson from Boca Raton, Florida. I would say I'm an earthling, right? Mm -hmm. So Anunnaki yeah. is that generalized term. Atlantean is the type of civilization they created. So And so um, basically what you find is that before the flood, they didn't even interact with the hominids that were on this planet. They didn't interact with us. Our cousins were here, not homo sapiens sapiens, but a different version of us was already here. Then they started tinkering because they wanted to create a slave race of people. And then after the flood, they decided to utilize this new tinker genetically modified version of a homo sapiens sapien. Uh, and they, they would create leaders of these areas. Like, for example, a pharaoh would be... And the, the initial pharaohs would be a direct bloodline of one of these Anunnaki people. In other words, it would be half human and half Anunnaki, where the term demigod comes from in Greek and Rome and all of that. Um, and so they would make that liaison, that bloodline liaison between them and the people. As time continued to go by and, and, and cultures and the way that the economics and the civilizations and the kingship and everything changed, they began to then, for whatever reason, handpick specific people to do specific things and they would then create these genetically modified or bloodline people yeshua was one of them um who i believe he was half human and half anunnaki that's just my personal opinion i have not read that anywhere but that's based on what i've researched yep. and what i know from studying ancient cultures i believe that he was not one and he well he, he himself said he's not of this world which means he's an alien okay that's the definition <laughs> that's true that's the definition uh and so i believe that he was a chosen one for whatever the full mission was. And I think the real mission was to bring a certain level of Christ consciousness, which existed before Jesus Christ, that terminology ever came to be. Christ consciousness is ancient, it's super ancient. And it's a certain level of consciousness that you, a person can get to this level where they're all knowing, all loving, they're, they're the epitome of service to others and unconditional love for, for one another. Uh, you know, a real true ascended being. And Jesus never said he was gonna return. He said the Christ would return. And he's mm -hmm. talking about the consciousness coming back to this planet and raising everyone up to a high level and bringing back a new golden age. Yeah, it's a level of consciousness where you have this crystallized consciousness where everything that you think of is about how can I become a problem solver? I'm not a victim. How can I help someone? How yeah. can I love this person better? Yeah. How can I solve problems before they happen? Because a genius will solve problems before they happen. So these people were high level thinkers. They'll think into the future and think of what all the outcomes can be and then mm -hmm. create solutions before they even need them. That mm -hmm. kind of level of thinking, uh, how to heal people, not, no suppression of medical technology and information mm -hmm. and stuff like that, creating a true super Christ civilization. If you like this clip and you want to hear the whole episode, click at the bottom of your screen.